Hey guys, the following is the recording of our GTBN Pastors Roundtable from Thursday, April 23rd. For the first 30 minutes, you'll see our conversation with Jefferson County Judge Jeff Brannick explaining where we are in the overall COVID-19 episode and what barriers and benchmarks need to be met before we can begin to move toward the resumption of public gatherings at our churches. The last 30 minutes includes our conversation among ourselves about where we proceed together from this point. We concluded our conversation with the intent to work together toward a soft launch of public gatherings by Sunday, May 17th. That gives us time to listen to updates from Governor Abbott's office about his intent to expand more of the economy. And that gives us time to see that the numbers of COVID-19 cases are continuing to trend down even as testing increases. There's no guarantee. For that reason, we're going to continue our weekly pastor Zoom conversations, Thursdays at 2 o'clock, specifically on May 7th and May the 14th, we will meet to assess whether we remain on track for that May 17th soft launch. So keep listening for information from myself and your colleagues. Understand that every church needs to do what they feel led to do. Uh, we're not going to prescribe the solution for any conversation. I would encourage you that however you proceed with the resumption of public gatherings, that you take the issues like your child care and, and the needs of our vulnerable population seriously as you begin to relaunch. So stay in the conversation with us. Uh, we're giving you as much information as we can along with our state convention partners. And if you have any questions or if there's any way that I can help you, give me a text or an email or a call. I'm right here with you. Know that I'm praying for you. God's continuing to work through the churches in our fellowship. Again, if I can serve you, let me know. God bless you. Amen. Hey guys, I thought with the quantity uh, of us online that I would start. I have about four questions for the judge that pertain to a lot of the questions I'm hearing from our guys in the field. And I thought I would give them an opportunity to respond to those. And then we will open up to any questions you guys have. Uh, but we can take about an hour of exchange with, with Judge Brannick. And then as uh, he goes on to other things, I know he has a full schedule then we can continue to visit about anything that we need to visit about. So does that work with you guys? Great. Yep. Well, then uh, I guess the first question, of course, everybody has on their mind what reopening the doors of our churches are. Judge, this has been a long season for you and for all of us. Uh, certainly, we're in a state where religious liberty is highly regarded, and, and so our churches don't feel compelled but they voluntarily and graciously complied with your emergency orders for slowing the spread of COVID-19. But we are looking for being able to get back. So I guess the first question I want to start with, where would you say are we here in Southeast Texas in the overall COVID-19 event? Uh, where are we trending? I think we're trending down. You would not have thought that watching the last few days results of uh, those positives that we've been getting in the evening. Um, but those were concentrated in a couple of nursing homes. Plus we did a major testing of 114 people at two Chick-fil-A Beaumont locations. And uh, we did a strike force testing at one of the nursing homes as well as uh, testing uh, via independent contractor in another nursing home. So those were very vulnerable populations, most of the people in their 80s or 90s. And so it looks as though we're going up, but Texas as a whole is going down. And I think we'll see over the next week that we're also on the backside of the curve. We're scheduled to be down to zero deaths per day uh, by mid-May. And uh, I think one of the problems is, is that we're getting uh, two different camps of information. 
you know, we're getting the Dr. Fauci camp that says the thing that we don't want to have happen is to, for us to be on the back side of that curve and then all of a sudden go back to life as normal and hit another spike, have to close down, go back down the curve, start living like normal and go back up. Uh, and they fully expect, I heard Dr. Fauci say this last night, to have uh, more tests come in the, or more cases come in the fall as the virus season becomes more active and it gets cooler. Uh, I think one thing is clear, at least until a therapeutic medicine or a vaccine becomes available, because on the opposite side from Dr. Fauci, you have those doctors who believe everybody ought to go about life as normal, and we ought to try to get to a place where we have herd immunities, and uh, there will be more deaths among the elderly. So I think that probably, well, I'll tell you, in my own case, I've got a fishing trip scheduled to Alaska June 12th, and I fully intend to go. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be willing at that point to get on an airplane. Uh, I probably wouldn't right now. Right. Uh, I still believe that for the next year, we're not going to be able to have any hugging at church. Uh, we're not going to be able to, particularly the elderly, I think, are going to want to be more careful about attending any gatherings. Uh, at just right before this call, I spent an hour on the phone with the governor, the six South County judges did. Uh, his medical, I had hoped that by tomorrow, his task force that's made up of doctors and business leaders and economists would have a report. He says it's probably not going to be until next Wednesday, but I know that he's committed to opening things in a, in a safe way. And, and you're right, Texas probably have, has the strongest religious liberty uh, laws in the nation. And there's nothing that prevents people from gathering right now for religious worship. But uh, he does still, like at my church, we're doing, we drive up church where we stay in our car and our pastor's preaching up off a podium in front of us. So what are that's the worked out very well for us. Good. Uh, and it's been a great experience for everybody. Uh, but I come from a church of huggers, so it's probably a good thing we aren't meeting together. <laughs> yeah. And so what are the benchmarks? Um, I've looked at the opening up America again piece on the multi-phase that the White House has put out. Um, what are the benchmarks that we need to be looking at before we would move into the first phase of resuming some sort of public gatherings? And what might that look like? Well, I think the, the key to, to really opening back up is testing, much more widespread testing. Up until this point, we've only been able at the county to do the swab test, which we've gotten an adequate supply to take care of at our testing site of the people who've signed up the day before, which normally runs around 100, 130 people a day. We're getting a little bit more of that supply now. I've fought and scratched for every piece of personal protective equipment I could get over the last month and a half. Um, it's very diff difficult to obtain right now, although when the president authorized the Defense Production Act, he uh, has upscaled the production to N95 and hospital gowns and gloves and all that by several different manufacturers. And so I feel like that PPE is gonna be more widely available in, in the weeks to come. We just got a big load in at the county from the State Operations Center, which makes me feel much better uh, because our earlier request would go unfulfilled and we had to rely on private laboratories for and donations by dentists and doctors to maintain our operations. We've now at the county opened up to anybody who wants to be tested, but the 
second part of that that formula in addition to testing is going to be for positive contact tracing mm -hmm. of those individuals just so we know how to contact individuals through our public health authorities uh, to make sure that they get isolated while we return to a semi-normal life. I don't think for the next year or so until we have therapeutics or vaccines that we're going to return to true normal. I think we're going to have to continue to wash and sanitize our hands frequently. I think we're going to have to continue to try to maintain distance between ourselves. Um, and <clears throat> hopefully more and more people will develop the antibodies. I'm going tomorrow morning to get tested for the antibodies. Uh, and we will get to that herd uh, place where everybody's immune. Okay. Uh, have you or and the governor's team or anything looked at what a phase up in gatherings would look like? I mean, at some point, will we hear that gatherings of 10 on our campuses would be recommended, 50s or a certain capacity, anything like that? My call with the governor last Friday, he just mentioned hypothetically maybe moving to 50 people. And uh, he's going to wait to hear back from his task force on the task force as the former FDA director, uh, former doctor who was the head of Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, a bunch of great infectious disease specialists. Uh, but, you know, we're going to have to open up reasonably soon because you have a growing group. I mean, Texans are independent by nature but you have a growing group of individuals who uh, don't believe that government should be involved in uh, taking people's individual liberties away. And we are doing that. I mean, there are times when government does do that to its citizens. Obviously, when you have a draft and you make an 18 year old go to war in a foreign country, you're, you're taking away their liberty interests. And, uh, there's some times when it's justified, but we don't want it to be. I, I'm not certain with what I've seen with the spread of the virus in our county. I'm, I'm having real internal conflicts about whether or not we're justified under these circumstances. Well, I really appreciate what you have to say with us. Um, Guys, I want to open it up to you guys. Do you all have any questions for Governor Brannock? You just gave me a promotion. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Wishful thinking. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, 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 would say, I would say this. is uh, You call him Governor Brannock, but Jeff knows that as a judge or any elected official, if he ran for any office, he has the uh, confidence of, and the reputation, the integrity that I'd vote for him on any office, to be honest, because I believe in Jeff that much. We may his be starting something here. Who knows? Yeah. His, his leadership has been uh, tremendous for a long time. And his testimony and faith in Christ is even, uh, you know, even greater than that. I just, uh, so I'm very grateful for our judge and for, I appreciate the last thing that you said in terms of some of the um, uh, dissonance that you feel personally about this, because I think, I think that's where a lot of people, we, we pastor Baptist churches, which are independent. Um, we fellowship or we agree to cooperate together, but we don't really have a hierarchy of structure, which, you know, which tells us, uh, gives us particular directions or mandates certain things. So the way I've explained it to our people in a recent piece is um, I said, you know, we, we are cooperating with our local government for the health and the well-being of our community and our church, the health and the well-being of our church. And like one great philosopher said, uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Um, so you've got, that was Spock, by the way, on Star Trek. And, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think our judge has asked us to do something that's in well, the well-being of our communities. Um, I, my posture as a pastor would be that if we were being compelled to do something because of a particular Christian belief, that would be a whole different matter. I would I would feel the necessity to 
to follow my conscience and, and God's law greater than any human declaration. But we're not being asked to compromise about our belief in Jesus or or even our worship of him or anything. So um, I've shared with our people, and I don't know, Judge, if this is if this is okay, but I, I told them that I was hoping we have we would have a soft launch of some kind by May 3rd. That's a couple of weeks. And by that a soft launch, we might have 50 people in the building, you know, something like that, um, and have various other locations where they would meet simultaneously. But anyways, that's that's our hope. And I told them we would be meeting with you and that if not by May 3rd, hopefully by May 10th for sure we could be begin to do that soft opening again. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, again, I, I'll reiterate what you said. Unless something the governor does does violence to my conscience, I have told him that I plan to be a team player with him. Uh, and I know that he is as anxious as anybody to get us back to some sense of normalcy, although, as I said, I don't think it'll be completely normal as it was before this uh, letdown of us by China, so. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? A question that I had was, are there specific needs that a church that you know of could address during this time? Uh, I looked at possibly doing a mass feeding or, and that's really not working out because of the uh, the stores of food, uh, the current food banks are the only ones that really can get a hold of those right now. They're trying to leave that to them. Talk about doing something with one of the hospitals to minister to our first responders. I was just curious if you had an idea of, man, I wish the churches would do this. Well, I think really the most important thing right now is to stay in touch with their elderly who are isolated. Uh, you know, there's a lot of loneliness out there amongst the elderly. There's a, uh, you know, I think you can continue to minister to those that, at least over the phone, that don't know how to operate computers or live streams, things of that nature. Right. But, uh, but I think the hospitals and, and those needs that exist out there are being filled internally uh, and they're taking care of them uh, maybe a note writing campaign by members of a church to uh, hospital workers to tell them how much you appreciate them guys anybody else so judge i got a question i uh so for smaller churches, I guess it's uh, more beneficial than larger churches. Uh, but when they start the guidelines of releasing where you can meet with, let's say, 50 people, how long do you feel? Because we're all in the same boat here. We know what it is to make decisions that you feel are in the best interest of your people. And you're always going to have people that agree with you and people that disagree with you. And, but yet we have to shoulder that just as you, and, and we do appreciate you. Uh, I guess my question is, how long do you think, for instance, it would stay in place at 50 before it's bumped to 100? Uh, just trying to think feasibly, how many services do we need to plan to have if we're running 200, but we can only have 50? And then Calvary, on the other hand, who runs 1,000, you know, how does that look for them? At what point does that progress? You know, I guess to the extent that they have larger facilities, they could spread out. 300 people over the facilities with video cameras or things of that nature. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, probably by the 1st of July, it's going to be hot enough, maybe by next week, that it's going to become a more inhospitable <laughs> environment for uh, viruses to exist on surfaces. And I'm told this virus does not like heat. So, I think the governor will be uh, as quick as he can while at the same time following the expert medical advice of his consultants 
But to be clear, if my orders exist and his orders exist, and the general rule is that my orders can be stricter than his orders, but they can't be less strict than his orders. So um, as far as numbers, uh, I could say fewer people than him, but I couldn't say more people than he allows. So, uh, and just to be very clear with respect to religious worship, uh, he and I both made it clear that we weren't going to stop any house of worship from doing whatever they want. All we could do is say, you know, we suggest based on the medical uh, physician's recommendations that this or this not be done or be done. Because nobody's going to go out. I'm sorry, go ahead. Nobody's going to go out here and arrest a preacher in Texas. <laughs> so is there going to be a time, though, that what, what I'm looking for, I understand there's no, we can meet whenever we want. There's no restriction saying that we absolutely cannot. But is there going to be a time that something comes out that it's really clear to everybody, hey, from the governor to local authorities on down, we believe now is the time to start worship service, just follow these guidelines, and then all of our churches come on board at the same time, or is somebody just need to stick their toe in the water and see how that works? Well, if you go to that website, COVID-19 Health Data, and find Texas under the United States, go down there and look at that curve. That curve goes down to zero deaths per day right around May 15th, May 16th. And I'm thinking when we get to that point, the governor's going to open it up some more as far as gathering sizes. And, but, you know, again, as I said earlier, I think, still think for the next year until we get a Tamiflu that works on COVID, I think we're probably going to need to uh, alter our ways. I won't be hugging anybody at church. I've got a lot of elderly women that hug on me and I, that's not going to be happening. <laughs> Your Honor, a lot of what I'm reading uh, from our state conventions and, and other sources suggests that, of course, and, and, and from the, the president's document coming out as well, as we phase in, even as we could meet in groups of 50 or 100, we still have advice for vulnerable persons to remain home and a lot of cautions with our children's ministries. Uh, children and social distancing are oxymoronic. They, they just don't fit. And so I'm hearing that our kids' ministries may actually be the last things to come online. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And even as we gather, what cautions do we need to take in the area of our kids? Well, certainly those that have compromised immune systems shouldn't be there either even if you know their children but uh, and they're the most likely ones to have the disease yet be completely asymptomatic and so uh, I, I think it's uh, you have to tread softly as you go in that direction uh, but I'm also thinking and the governor said today that we should in the coming two or three weeks, be much more prepared with different forms of rapid testing devices. Now, those are go going to go to the hospitals so far first, and the hospitals have locally have received the machine, but they have not received the cartridges that the machines utilize to test. And so that's what the governor thinks we're going to start getting a lot more of next week. And then they'll move to uh, bringing those testing uh, machines to our public health departments in Port Arthur and at Jefferson County. The Beaumont Health Department does not do any testing. Uh, matter of fact, I, throughout this event, I hadn't figured out what they do. But uh, it's uh, I actually, to start getting the data I needed, which the Office of uh, Civil Rights and, and the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level, their director called me and told me I'm entitled to this information and uh, sent me 
some guidance, which I provided to the city of Beaumont city attorney, they still didn't want to turn over information that I could report to the public. And I hate it when it gets to this place, but I finally had to uh, say the sheriff is going to be there in the morning to arrest your health director if I don't have the information. So it's been a, a, a difficult journey with the city of Beaumont, their EOC, we've worked with very well and they do a great job, but it's, it's just, uh, Port Arthur has health department has responded very admirably. And as a matter of fact, for the first couple of weeks ran our testing site at the airport. So very pleased with them, but I think it's just gonna, I, I think the real key to returning to normal is going to be a, be in being able to do very rapid testing being able to identify those that have the antibodies and uh, then having our health departments better staff to do uh, contact follow-ups. And the closer we get to that, the more normal we'll be. But y'all will have a lot of decisions, particularly where you have facilities that are smaller. Right. Judge Brannick, I know we're coming to the end of our time with you. We're going to continue meeting. Uh, do you have a word you would like to share with our pastors? Well, I, said, I, I just am deeply appreciative for uh, uh, the role that y'all play in our communities and in our spiritual lives and in trying to reach those people who are without the kingdom with uh, mm -hmm. the wonderful news. Uh, Joe knows my story but i didn't get saved till i was 37 years old at a promise keepers conference in dallas texas in 1995 and uh, i appreciate those that uh, unashamedly profess the gospel amen amen. amen well thank you thank you we would like to pray for you before you leave uh it's good to see jordan rogers with us on this uh brother jordan would you lead in a prayer uh for our leadership through this and especially for judge brannock absolutely thank you our father in heaven hallowed be your name lord we ask that uh lord that through all of these events that are taking place lord in this world that you own father i pray that you would glorify your name as it is your pleasure to do Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom. You do tell us in your word, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who will give liberally and give freely to us. So, Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom and give us understanding. Lord, you also command us and give us the privilege of praying for our, our government officials. Father, we pray for our president, Lord, for those who are uh, advising him. Father, for our local officials, even uh, Lord, especially now for Judge Brannick, Father, I pray that you would give him wisdom and give him understanding, Lord, give him clarity, uh, Lord, to be able to discern between the many voices that he hears and to know truth. Father, we know that your spirit and your word is called the spirit of truth. And Father, we pray that you would give him an understanding of what's, what's true out there in this uh, mess of information that comes out. Father, give him clarity and Lord, also give him conviction. Lord, when uh, leadership decisions need to be made, Lord, for all of these men who are serving your kingdom uh, through these churches here in uh, the Golden Triangle, Father, I pray that you give us clarity, give us conviction, and Lord, um, Lord, in all things, Father, before the return of your son, I pray that you would, um, Lord, cause mm. such a massive ingathering of souls for your kingdom, Lord, that... Um, Lord, that we would look back at this time, Lord, when we are uh, gathered there in eternity, and we will marvel by the, the wonderful work that you did through this. Lord, I pray that you would glorify your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Judge Brannett. And thank you all so much for having me. I'm, uh, I said in a prayer at my church the other day, I said, I know I'm not in control. I know who's in control. Amen. So all I want to do is be an instrument, and I, I hope I have the ears to hear. Amen. Thank you. God Thank bless y'all. Thank you, and you too. Hey, guys, uh, we want to give you guys as much time to unpack this as you need, but in case you need to leave early, uh, I tried to upload on the chat uh, four documents for you.
uh, if you don't have them. The revised guidance from the AG's office and the governor uh, for churches, the guidelines for opening up America from the White House that were released last week, a great piece by the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention on regathering the church, and then a spreadsheet shared with me by a friend of mine at Lifeway on phase, a phased restart spreadsheet as a planning guide. Uh, it looks like a really helpful instrument. That spreadsheet includes a sample and then a blank sheet you can use in your planning. Uh, if you have difficulty, if it doesn't show up on the chat, I will also be posting it on the GTV and Pastors Facebook page, and you can send me an email, and I'll email it to you if you need it. Uh, but the president's document especially spells out what the phased reopening might look like and the different numbers we may be talking about. So those are available to you, but at this point, where do you want to take our conversation? So it doesn't seem like we're really any closer than we were right now, still in a holding point. I'm kind of, I'm kind of waiting on a, on a clear, definitive, I mean, I would love for us to all agree to start meeting together at the same time, but it, it doesn't look like that's going to happen that way. There may be, I don't know, there may be 10 here, 50 there, and, and you know, I, I just don't know. I don't know what to think. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in Winnie, which is, I think there might be one case in Winnie. Um, so that's, that's pretty isolated from everything. But, you know, I, I'm wanting us to, I think that the, the church that jumps in first before everybody else is going to be in, looked at as a, as a radical who doesn't care about the community. And I think that the last church that jumps in is going to be looked at over cautious and, and is not as concerned about public worship. So I think, I think we're in a bad spot. I have a uh, question about, um, I don't know if anybody's thought about it, but the possibility of opening up um, uh, with kind of multiple avenues in, in, in-house worship in the worship center uh, in the parking lot uh, drive-in worship and uh, and then continuing online maybe all three i'll tell you what breaks my heart in the whole thing and that is uh either way you look at it they're strongly discouraging your 65 and older from not even attending and uh Man, those are those. I'll be honest; those are the people I miss the most. Uh, but you know, one of the deals I read yesterday, Jim, it may have been the SBC article that said you may just want to consider just having a service just for sixty-five and older. Uh, right. And so that's a great avenue to approach there. Yeah, the governor's piece talks about um, or uh, the regathering the church piece. I've read so many pieces; the information starts to run together. But yeah. One of the converse, one of the uh, suggestions is if you've got vulnerable folks, uh, at least you have a senior service, and at least that reduces their exposure to the children and others who are likely to be asymptomatic carriers. Now the president's piece, and again, how much the governor embraces this. This document uh, is at the governor's discretion, it notes, but it talks about a two-week timetable of seeing a reduction in, in COVID-19 incidents and other flu-like symptoms. And with those 14 consecutive days, then entering a phase one where groups of up to 10 are permissible uh, with social distancing. And then another two weeks of those numbers ramping up to groups of 50, uh, having families gather together. Certainly, whatever we do, when we start gathering in groups larger than 10 especially, we still need to think the sanitary stuff. Uh, one of my concerns is uh, the governor and, and our judge are right. We are free to do what we feel led to do today. Uh, but just because it's permissible, is it best? And, and one of the things I would encourage us is when we launch, whenever that is, 
we have a whole lot of issues about sanitation, especially our children's areas and hallways. Don't think just in terms of the size of your worship center, because if you've got a worship center, you've got a church running 50, and a worship center that has 300, holds 300, you can think you're great, except that they all walk narrowly through a little hall that creates the problem. So there are a whole lot of things about our facility, and that's why a joint, all of us doing the same thing together is going to be really difficult because a, a lot of what might be best for us is going to be driven not only by the size of our churches, but the layout of our facilities and what's available to us. So I don't know if this is even a possibility. I don't want to throw Clay under the bus, but uh, Clay, you guys are probably the largest church. For instance, I, those of you that have seen our facility, we can easily seat about 375 to 400 in our auditorium, but we mapped it out the other day. And if we go with a six foot increment, we can only get 80 people in our auditorium. So we know we're already looking at what we need to do strategically uh, to move forward. But I, I would like to know, like for instance, the Calvaries that are out there. Uh, at what point, I mean, because as I said, you don't return to the new normal maybe for a year, you know, where you get back to where things were. What does that look like for you guys, Clay? Have y'all thought about that? I, I know y'all have two services, but what does that look like? Yeah, we're, we're starting to talk about that. We're even thinking about increasing the number of services. Uh, you know, we've got uh, the Lumberton campus and then here at Beaumont uh, being able to do more services. And so it's, it's a live video feed of Nathan up to Calvary North anyway. So we could show that as many times as we needed to. We need to spread those people out a little more. Jordan, what kind of conversation are you guys having at Hillcrest? Um, honestly, right now, it is that when, when we start to open back up, that um, the hope is to be able to have our people gather by Sunday school class. And they can, that way we can divide the number of people we have into much smaller groups for easier management. Mm -hmm. And, and be in communication with those Sunday school teachers because if, the, if at their discretion they give us information that there's uh, too many kids amongst, amongst those adults, then they would need to tell us that way we can say, you know, y'all just need to keep from gathering at this point, but we're going to maximize the amount of people that can gather together and maintain that type of distance. The, the main ones that I'm concerned about, like all of you as well, is our seniors, um, because I've gotten word that they're um, le less than I would have thought, but there are, there are a number of our seniors who do not, they do not use social media, they don't access, and even this kind of pressure has not forced their hand to learn it. And so what we've done to accommodate that is um, I will um, essentially just, we'll, we'll burn DVDs and we'll have our deacons uh, administer those DVDs to them and they can, then they can watch the services uh, on the DVD player. Um, I don't, I don't have the ability to replicate VHSs or, <laughs> or make a VHS. So I'm, I'm hoping that they all have a DVD player. Um, but that, that's really where we're at. I, I know for us, our, the increase of our online viewing has, has shot through the roof. Uh, we're, we're reaching uh, well over, you know, well over 1,500 extra people through our online streaming than we were when we were streaming before this took place. And that, that's 1,500 extra on top of what we were reaching through online and those who are actually coming on campus. And so um, I'm thankful for that, but I'm also wondering about the people who fall through the cracks and um, how to keep track of those, which I'm, I'm very thankful for our deacons because they, you know, we've divided our people up in our deacon family ministry, like all of you have, and we can keep track of our, our elderly that way. I don't, I don't want to be, 
I don't want to be the guy that jumps in and says, hey, we're going to gather. We're, we're, we're tired of this. We think it's safe. We're going to gather because you run the risk of, of really tarnishing the testimony of the church. Um, because as soon as you gather, if someone comes down with a virus and Lord forbid a senior get, get that virus and then pass, you're, you're talking about some serious damage to the testimony of the church, not to mention the fact that, you know, you, you put your people at risk. And that's a very real concern that someone might, might pass. And um, I'm, I'm all for jumping in the water together that, that we come to some sort of decision um, that on this date, when we've gotten permission from the governor and from the judge that it's okay. But uh, um, I don't, I definitely don't want to jump the gun. Amen. You know, if we would have, if we would have continued to meet, <clears throat> uh, we met the first Sunday, but the next one, I sensed that we were probably not going to be meeting the next few, but it, had we persisted and continued to meet, we would have had two people in one of our adult classes who do have the virus, didn't, didn't, wouldn't have known it at the time because they picked it up from their granddaughters. They would have been, they potentially would have infected the entire adult department. And, and so I think Jordan's correct in that then how would we going to explain that? It just would have been, um, I mean, it's just catastrophic, right? I mean, our understanding, our theologically, our understanding of the church is much deeper than, than a, a specific place that we meet. But um, uh, I think whatever decision you men make, I mean, God's going to give us wisdom in the context in which we are. You know, we're looking at a soft in, uh, opening, uh, utilizing the various large spaces we have across our facility and also doing something separate for our seniors. And so that, be, I mean, the seniors are available during the day. You realize most of our seniors, you can have a noonday service, which we used to have a Wednesday um, uh, service for them at noon. So, you know, you could do a noonday service for that matter for the, for these folks and they would enjoy it. And uh, you could, you could touch their lives. It wouldn't have to be on Sunday. Amen. So Joe, I've got a question. I got a question for Joe, something Jim and I talked about. If you have multiple services, and I, I loved what Judge said because it's what Jim and I talked about is, is putting people in different parts of our facility. However, what do we do? How do we work the parking lot? You know, because that's where the people are going to congregate. That, you know, how do we, how, is there a solution for that? Uh, because like right now, we have run out of parking anyway. But how do we do that? Well, if, if you do two, uh, this is a thought, and of course, you know, everybody, I'm not saying we, we've talked about this. If we ran two services and you divided your departments, your con what we call connect groups or Bible study groups, if they were to meet, we have various areas. So we could enter our building at about six, six different places. Um, maybe, I think it's about six places. So we would create areas where those departments would enter at those locations. When our ushers would and greeters would be there to open the doors for everybody, we'd have sanitizing stations. Those you do the best you can, right? So that's what that's what uh, one thought is that we we would just divide it up. We might do us you know two services on Sunday and divide our group up. You can fit a lot of people. What I what I guess I'm I'm we've struggled with is that if you just put 50 people in the sanctuary, in a sanctuary our size, and then you scatter the rest of them around the building. Um, we're thinking we still might pre-record our service, <laughs> not have anybody in the sanctuary. And then we as pastors would, we would meet with the various small groups. And so it would be a pre-recorded uh, service. They, they sort of have got, you know, gotten wind of that anyways, because we're interacting with them on YouTube as they're watching the service. We're actually talking with them. So um, they're like, how can you be doing, is this live? Uh, we're not doing live because of the internet issues, but. That's our, that's, we're going to try to do something like that. We've been doing drive-in church. This will be our fifth Sunday. And what we found out, people are going to park and go where they want to go. We've had the guys in our parking lot who have gotten really frustrated because, you know, as strange as it sounds, the people who sit on the back row in church sit on the back, they park on the back of the parking lot. So uh, we're a Baptist church and it's hard to make them go where you want them to go. They're Baptist. Jim, I was curious if, if you might be able to um, 
offer what you would feel like would be a good, um, I guess some numbers for us looking at May, we've got five Sundays in May. And just where we kind of, I mean, that was a question, I guess all of us were looking for from the judge is, you know, what Sunday, how many, um, you know, we know he's going to Alaska in, in June, but how, what does it look like for you if in May, if you were just to offer us leadership, when would you say, and, um, and that's, that's question number one. And I guess the other one is, I just really struggle with um, the value of what we're doing because I'm seeing some really good value and it, it, I almost feel like some people are so anxious and I'm not saying you guys, I'm, I'm talking about just church members are so anxious to come back together, but the coming back together, um, it's like we want to get back to the way we were. Yeah. And I'm not sure getting back to the way we were is yeah. really where we want to be. No, um, I've, I've digested every Zoom meeting from denominational and ministry leaders across the country that I could addressing this issue. Uh, I'm curious, uh, I'm waiting to hear how the governor embraces what the White House put out because it does spell out a nice phased relaunch. But as long as the COVID-19 numbers are trending the right direction, gives you about two weeks of progress. I was hoping the judge would be able to say that we're one week into meeting those criteria. And if so, then we would be at what they've defined as phase one, which is moderate social distancing. You still stay at home, uh, but groups of 50. And if we're within two weeks of that, I know for a larger church that may not make that big of a difference, uh, but if we can at least, if, if we knew that by this week we could, get, we could be at groups of 50, then at least we could stand, we could do something. This is going to be a phased reopening. A week into this, I thought this would be over, and we would hear the word, okay, it's over, and now you can go back to your gatherings. And that's not going to be the case. This is going to be stair steps. And, and, and the next level for us is that 50 level. I would hope by the middle of May, by the middle of May, that we could be cleared to do groups of 50. That probably means no, not the child care ministry per se. We would still be doing online. But at least whether we had multiple groups of 50 on our campus or whether it was a smaller group meeting with still moderate social distancing, that we could move with that. Um, and then two weeks with those numbers continuing to progress, then you'd be at the next phase, which is unlimited numbers, but still a degree of distancing. Um, I'd hope to be at that by mid-May. You hope to or had hoped? <clears throat> I hope to. Uh, I think it's still possible. The judge, you know, he talked about what the governor's putting out. He wants us ramped up. Um, we're not going to see unlimited groups until we're into June, at least, at the soonest. But I'd, I'd be very surprised myself if by the middle to the end of May that we're not at least given the clear for groups of 50. Well, that's what he said. He said May 15th, this is Warren. Yeah. Um, that the uh, COVID-19 data uh, website showed zero deaths. Um, that's pretty, it's pretty radical to, um, to think, you know, to say we're not going to open until we see zero deaths. Um, I, I agree with you, Jim. I, I, I think in the next week or two, uh, I would like to see some kind of, um, some kind of opening. Well, and, and of course, the president's guidelines are, are based on continued trends. And assuming those numbers continue to trend in the right direction, then the plan, you know, I'm not beyond setting May 17th as a target date for shooting for some kind of gatherings. Uh, if we do that, we need to take the sanitation very carefully. One, my concern are these groups that say, hey, the governor says we can meet, and, and they're rushing in, and they're hugging each other, and, and, and they're, they're ignoring all the other protocols. And I'm with Jordan. I don't want to be the cause of spreading this thing. 
And even worse, I don't want to send a signal to my unbelievers in the community that we care more about getting money in an offering plate than we do their well-being. And that's what they're going to see if we jump the gun too soon. But I think if we take the protocol seriously, if we over-communicate what we're doing to be secure as we get that message out there, then I think the 17th would be reasonable for groups of 50. I saw today that um, it looks like the 1st of May that the governor should be opening up quite a bit more uh, economic outlets. Yeah. He's expanding opportunity for business. And I think what, what I'm looking for is um, what's going to happen with that because you're going to have, that's essentially what we're talking about with a soft launch. Yeah. It's a little bit harder of a launch than, than soft really, because you're going to start having, I mean, he was talking in that piece about uh, people going to restaurants and dining in. Yeah. And so my thought is watch that, yes. watch that for a couple of weeks because that may be a, a test run to see if, if that kind of, of phasing up is going to see an increase in cases. And if there's an increase in cases, that's an easy thing for the governor to say, Hey, let's phase back those, those options that you had. And I would say, let, let them test the water at least what I'm, what I'm thinking, I let him test the water. And if the cases still seem to be down yeah. and he starts to say, you know, this is going pretty well, then I think it would be, it, we would have a precedent. The church would have a precedent to say, look, we allowed the governor to take the first step. Yeah. We allowed him to test the water. And after he tested the water, we followed suit after we thought it was safe. And so it wouldn't be that we would be jumping out immediately with the governor's orders to open up these other small businesses. And then it takes away that, uh, the main concern yeah. that I, for me, at least I had, which is if we jump the gun yeah. and cases start to spread, people are going to blame the church. That's right. Well, and I think there's wisdom in that. Uh, it's certainly not a driving motivator, but in a conference, in a call with Tony Wolf yesterday, uh, there haven't been any lawsuits filed, but attorneys are having the conversation. They are waiting for us to open and waiting for somebody to get sick so they can test the waters about liability for cases that can be traced back to the churches. So the, the ambulance chasing community is having that conversation now. So again, the more discretion we take, the more reasonable prudence we exercise, you, you know, um, we don't close the door on the harassment of those things, but we do protect the church by exercising prudence. Joe, you said that you were looking at a, a soft launch the 1st of May, May the 3rd. Uh, yeah. And to follow up with that question on, uh, would we as a um, network of pastors be comfortable with saying that uh, much like what Jordan was saying is, is to look at May 17th as a soft lunch uh, for all of us. So we're kind of protecting each other's back to mm -hmm. say we're in a coalition together to say this is when we believe we'll take that first step into the water. Yeah. And, and we've done something that it's not unrelated, but it is, uh, you know, it's a connection point. All of you guys have great ideas of stuff you're doing, but uh, we're offering a drive through prayer service where people have a you know window of time to come and we stand at a distance from the car, but it gives us opportunity to talk to them face to face as well as to pray with them. And uh, even though we don't have masses turning out, they know that they have that opportunity. There's that sense of connectedness there. And uh, that serves kind of a purpose where they can feel more connected. But, but anyway, Joe, I'd, I'd like to know and, and I'd like for the rest of you guys to know if, is it, is that too late? Are you guys okay on May 17th? Could we, could we reach an agreement? Try to follow your lead, Jim, and, and direction on this. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, Ray. And I, I think just in our conversation, you know, when I wrote our folks, I, I was just trying to cast some hope toward, hey, we are going to be meeting. And I, we, didn't, we didn't tell them any detail other than we're thinking about this. We're going to be in a conference with Jeff Brannick, Judge Brannick, 
and we'll be able to get back to you. And I think because of our meeting, even now with you guys, uh, I think it would be wise if we attempted something simultaneous, the 10th, the 17th, not the third for sure, but, uh, um, you know, but I'm, I'm perfectly willing to cooperate with you guys and make it the same day. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to do that for sure. Chris, we haven't heard from you. What are you thinking, brother? Uh, yeah, I listened to the governor yesterday say that we were on day 13 of the downtrend. So today would be day 14. Uh, also heard from somebody in, in Austin that uh, the announcement could come as early as Monday, but then Brannick said Wednesday. Um, I think phase one of the Trump stuff will start at the end of the week, which would be two weeks from there would be that phase two, which makes the 17th a reasonable, a reasonable date. Um, maybe we, you know, I like the idea of protecting ourselves with the numbers that we have and, and having a simultaneous opening. Um, you, you do, that gives you almost a month, a little less, three, three Sundays of, of online to kind of look at your ingress and egress. I think that's a big deal. Uh, vestibules, little bitty vestibules where you block a bunch of people, you know, you'd have to have, you know, your greeters telling people to go in single file or whatever. Um, I, I had a lot of questions I was going to ask him, but he didn't seem to have many answers. So I didn't ask him like uh, dismissing families. I know that was uh, in the Trump conversation. Actually, no, that was in the governor Abbott letter that came out on the 22nd dismissing and, uh, and how that all works, dismissing and families. Uh, um, anyway, so yeah. So following your ingress, egress, uh, figuring out, how to do multiple rooms. That's going to be the, the science of church for the next uh, month. But I, I like the idea of a 17th uh, coordinated opening. If we do that, then if we can all agree to that, then I would say we need to have another one of these video meetings, say the week before that, um, to see if we're really going to pull that trigger. You know, um, maybe the Friday before that, uh, whatever that would be. Because we would need time to, if we're going to pull back and not do the 17th, maybe we meet on the, the 14th of May. Uh, maybe we meet on the 7th of May. I don't know. Yeah, well, we've been, I've been setting up a regular Thursday pastor Zoom uh, at 2 o'clock. Uh, again, if that week another time would be better doing it that Friday instead of Thursday, we could do that. But, um, but we're setting like up Thursday. these every week. Sir? I said, I like Thursday. If we could just agree that we're all going to get back on okay. on a particular Thursday at two o'clock and whether or not we pull the trigger or not, um, you know. Do we need a little bit more lead time than Thursday for that particular conversation? Uh, Thursday the 14th, is that good? Or should we go maybe to Tuesday the 12th? You know, I, I've been of the mind to wait to the last minute. Okay. That first week when we had to cancel worship that first week and do it online, live worship and do it online, I waited till Friday to pull the trigger. And I'm so glad I did because the judge's orders came out that, that Friday yes. and I didn't have to retract any statements. So I don't know. My rule of thumb has been wait to the last minute with this thing. Unlike the, the hurricane work that we've done, this, this things change day to day to day. So yeah. Um, getting the word out that we're not having that service on the 17th. If something changes, if there's an outbreak somewhere, yeah. you know, in our area and we got to figure out something, I, I just think maybe wait to the last minute. Very good. So Jim, my question is, uh, because I believe in the complete autonomy of the local church and uh, I believe we're all independent, but, uh, but my question is soft opening. So are we talking about, and Chris, you might want to allude to this, uh, are we talking about Sunday's main worship only? Because, I mean, honestly, I, I don't think you open up nurseries right now. I don't think you, even our Sunday schools, I'm in one of our rooms right now. And I know our people are saying, oh, we can get together to Sunday school. But you know what? If we maintain the six foot, I can fit about three people in this room. And so <laughs> there's a lot of planning that's got to go into that. Yeah. And maybe if we could come up with a list of things, okay, <clears throat> this is because that article, I go back to uh, – it may have been Tony Wolf or Ed Stetzer, the things that will not be the same again in church, uh, you know, and so I don't know, maybe that. Yeah, I, you know, for me, soft opening would be around that 50 mark and multiple rooms, no childcare, um, 
they can sit in family units with an X number of seats between them. Yeah. Um, that's going to have to be the, the, the reality. I think we, our seats are 22 inches. So six feet, <laughs> yeah. yeah, six feet divided by 22 inches. That's how many, how many chairs between family units. Yeah. Um, cause I mean, a family unit's living in their house together. They're not keeping right. six feet apart from each other. Uh, and then dismissing them, uh, either by rows or by family units and just you know, protecting it that way, showing that we're going out of, we're still worshiping together. We're going out of our way to keep that 50 number and some social distancing and, and double tripling our cleansing of our buildings. You know, if you clean it one time a week, maybe clean it three times a week, depending on when you're meeting. Uh, you know, if you're not, if you're only meeting on Sunday, you're not meeting the entire rest of the week. Then yeah, you don't need to clean it. But um, yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, antibacterial soap at every, every station. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a, I have a question. Um, as long as we're waiting for the last minute, then um, what prohibits us from meeting next Thursday? Um, well, not next Thursday, it would be the, it would be the 7th, May 7th, in case something happens, what's is that, two weeks away? Um, that's two yes. weeks away, um, you know, I mean, wow, a lot's going to happen in two weeks. I mean, I, I know that for sure. Well, and I'm scheduling meetings until we're through this. Uh, Thursday at, at uh, two o'clock. So uh, okay. we'll have, for those who want to meet and visit on this on the seventh, uh, there'll certainly be a platform available to do so. Yeah, seventh and fourteenth. Call it on the fourteenth. Yeah. You know? Can I get a Can I get a clarification? Um, because it really is the game changer. If this is if I'm misunderstanding something. Up to fifty, still maintaining social distancing. Is that is is that all right? Because I'm thinking, that's how I'm reading it. Okay, because I'm thinking up to 50 people in the room without necessarily social distancing, but respect toward the hugging, the, you know, the bodily contact kind of thing. So, I mean, you're, if you're talking about still social distancing, distancing with 50 people at best, well, that changes your venues in a hurry because you've re functionally reduced your space to, I don't know anybody who has that kind of space. Every yeah, written are guideline that I have seen on phase two at the 50 requires the social distancing as well. Me too. Same here. Yeah. It's same. Wow. They're saying to maintain all CDC guidelines. And so yeah. that's going to be, and that's going to be, as judge said, that's going to be probably a year. There's a article out that uh, major sporting events and all concerts will not resume until fall of 2021. Well, I won't be going to any for sure, yeah. but <laughs> so I heard him Man, that's hey a guys, good I know that it's uh, social distancing among family units. That's correct. That does give you a little more capacity if you're right. if you're keeping a family unit. The next family unit is six feet, so it's it's a little more capacity. So I'm reading from Governor Abbott's April 21st thing on houses of worship, and he says uh, following the CDC, and then he gives bullet points, and one of the bullet points among at, at a worship service is practice social distancing by maintaining appropriate distance between people. Um, and that's talking about during the worship. So, so yeah, so family units know, you know, they don't have to have seats between, between themselves, friends who are living together or whatever, however, you know, if you have roommates from college students or whatever, they get to stay together, but yeah. Guys, I don't want to throw a, a, a wrench in the whole system. But we met with a today that talked about the issue of socialing distance. That, well, that's fine. But when you start singing and, uh, you know, worshiping, that, that six foot has to expand a long ways. So, uh, you know, that may be something we need to think about. Yeah, only special music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, corp no congregational music. singing, right? Well, I mean, that to me, if, if that's the case, and I mean, we're, we're trying to abide by guidelines that are national and not necessarily local or even unique to our state in terms of the statistical data. Uh, in Orange County, we don't, I mean, let's just deal with the reality. There's not a death in Orange County at this point from what I last understood. We, we do have some deaths, I'm not discounting those, but I mean, that's a real, May 17th doesn't even seem practical if you're really, if you're really looking at, I think, like Raymond said, if we go back, if our people want to rush to go back to something like it once was, this is a great chance to actually take them forward into something that it needs to be. And so I might be more inclined to delay my May 17th even much later. Yeah. 
if you distance that much, you might as well just keep the families at home and let families say, hey, you're already partnering with, I know our families are already gathering with two or three families that they already feel comfortable with, knowing that, you know, their social interactions. We have people over at our home, families that come, two families at a time in the afternoons, and uh, they meet in our back, back of our home. But um, they're comfortable with each other. And that's how we allow them to meet. If you can bring another family, so they might be do, they might do better meeting at someone's home with 15 or 20 people that they feel comfortable in their social circle is not violating the you know the principles involved here, and they might get more out of that than filing in in our churches, not talk hardly talking to anybody. You can't do congregational singing because you're projecting your breath and your whatever. And then you've got a spinning preacher, preacher up there. You, you need to watch Raymond McHenry's message from Sunday. He's spitting all over the place and, uh, you know, spitting on the people. But, uh, by the way, Raymond's message, I've talked too much. Raymond's message Sunday, you guys need to listen to it. It's a masterpiece of a message. It really is. There is one thing, and I don't know if we take it seriously or not, but Governor Abbott's statement on the top of the third page, one of the bullet points ensure all attendees sanitize their hands and put on a face mask before entering the building. Uh, are we going to conceive of having our, our initial gatherings with everybody masked? <laughs> and where you can find the masks. Where have all the quilting circles gone? <laughs> And how do you how do you choose the fifty people that get to come to church? <laughs> One of the suggestions I have heard, if we're at fifty for a while, is you know cycle. You, you know, you may have a different crew at church each week, but at least they're having some sense of the gathering, and we're still doing the online, and we're still doing the other stuff. And and so you know they're they're talking about having people sign up, rotating Bible study units. Uh, yeah, that that that's the other thing we're going to have to look at. How do we measure that fifty? Hey guys, for those who joined us late, uh, I am recording this meeting, uh, including the uh, judges' comments. And I will be emailing uh, out and posting on the GTB and Pastor Staff Facebook page those four mm -hmm. documents. Uh, so uh, if you don't have them, it's the governor's document that Chris has referred to, uh, President Trump's piece, the uh, proposed uh, opening up America again, and then a spreadsheet and, um, and uh, a piece from Southern Baptist of Texas on re, uh, regathering. Uh, any other resources that come along the way, I'll be sure to make available to you as well. Uh, uh, we're, we're moving toward the 17th. We're, we're, we're visiting on the 7th and 13th uh, to assess that as we move forward. Is there anything that you guys have pressing that we want to put out there before we wrap up this afternoon? I want to thank you guys for getting on board. If you are not on the GTB and pastor staff page, let me know and I'll send you the video by email. I uh, get this stuff to you at another means. Um, I appreciate you guys giving the time and I've been looking at your online stuff and your services, your drive in uh, God's moving through the churches in our fellowship, even during this season. And so I'm grateful for every one of you. Help me watch out for the vulnerable among us. Uh, we've got resources. If there's a pastor missing a paycheck or, or things going hard, uh, we've got several who've lined up to help. Uh, I'm watching. I'm not seeing anything, but I could use your eyes looking out for that as well. So if you know somebody on one of our staff teams whose job's maybe not there anymore, or somebody who's hurting in any other ways, get that to me. And certainly if there are material needs, uh, we'll be there together to help look after those. Hey, Jim, it's Bruce one more time. Yeah. If, if y'all don't mind, I just got a text. I'm gonna have to go. We, uh, one of our little pre-K students drowned uh, oh, this morning. Wow. And uh, uh, it, uh, it looks like it's one of the Hampshire Finette pre-K students, not one here at our church, but, uh, 
anyway, I've got to go call a family member that just texted me about this. And uh, if you guys don't mind, uh, the Tubbs family, the little boy's name is Ryder Thompson. Uh, his father is Mason Tubbs. And so if you guys don't mind, just pray for them. Okay. We will, we're about to wrap this up. We'll pray now for him. Um, thanks for sharing for that. And we'll be praying for you as you minister to the family. Hey, Jim, before you sign us off, uh, yes. I want to express my gratitude for your leadership. I just appreciate the many different ways that you are helping us stay connected and stay informed and helping us out with just a, a myriad of things. You're doing a masterful job, and I really appreciate that. And I wanted to say that before Josh closes in prayer. Thank you. Um, I'm humbled. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate you guys. Uh, I'm looking at my screen. Where is Josh? I, I was going to ask him. <laughs> Josh, uh, real quickly, how are things at Sojourn? Oh, we're doing just fine. We're doing all right. Absolutely. We're making it. Would you close us out, please? Absolutely. Father, we come to you, and uh, we, uh, we, we've we talked much today about wisdom, and we just confess again uh, our need for your wisdom. Uh, you know the future. We do not. And so as we speculate and do our best, we, we entrust you. Uh, again, with our lives and, and our people, and we ask that you would uh, just graciously reveal your will to us uh, in these days. Uh, God, I pray for, for each of these men and their churches. I'm so thankful uh, just to be able to be together in partnership in the gospel uh, and in your kingdom. And so, God, I pray for your blessing uh, on all of us, uh, that we would uh, continue uh, to hold fast to your word, hold fast to what's true. Uh, in these days. Uh, Father, I pray uh, for this, this terrible situation that we just found out about uh, with, with uh, this young child who's passed away so tragically. Father, would you be with that family? Uh, would you give grace and peace uh, in these days? Uh, would your church uh, be a beacon of hope and light and comfort uh, to that family? Uh, and Father, you, even in the darkest moment, would you uh, bring about uh, light and hope uh, in the days uh, that come out of this this tragedy. Uh, Father, again, we entrust everything to you. Uh, we put our hope again in Christ and in him alone. And Father, we pray that uh, as we know, we, we look at the numbers, we know that, that many more people are tuning in uh, to our services. Father, we pray that that, that would translate into the salvation of many uh, in these days as so many are, are questioning uh, the foundation they've built their lives on. Father, uh, would you bring many to faith uh, and, and many to hope in Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. Hey guys, before you go, let me ask you one more thing. Uh, when you get the video for this, uh, keep it among us or, or your teams. Uh, I inadvertently promoted our county judge to governor a time or two, and I don't want to do anything to create any embarrassment for him. Okay. <laughs> Thanks guys. Y'all take care. Love y'all.